All right, Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing, or for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. After laying an extensive theological foundation in chapters 1 through 11, Paul begins Romans chapter 12 with a hinge that connects everything that he's already said to what he'll say to the end of this letter. This is where doctrine turns to practical application, the outworking of Christian behavior and life together in the church. I appeal to you, therefore, verses 1 and 2, the hinge that we're talking about, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, because of God's rich mercy, followers of Jesus Christ are expected to conduct themselves differently than they once did. No longer are they to live like the world for their own passions and desires, but rather all that they are, all that they have, and all they'll ever be is to be dedicated to the Lord. This calls for an all-in commitment where nothing is held back and everything is laid on the altar. To present one's body as a living sacrifice is to live a transformative life where instead of living to satisfy our own appetites like we once did, we now live to please God, which means as far as our conduct and behavior is concerned, we're to live our lives with intentionality where we think about what we do, we think about where we go, we think about who we're hanging out with, where everything that we do honors Christ. Romans six twelve. Paul wrote this earlier in this letter. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments 
for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. To be a believer in Jesus Christ is to live a radical life of obedience to Christ. In verses 3 through 8 of chapter 12, Paul talked about grace. We spent five weeks looking at these five verses. He talked about the grace given to him, the grace given to us, the gift of our salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the gift of spiritual gifts, which equip the saints for work of ministry, the building up of the body of Christ. And what's truly encouraging about what Paul writes is every single believer is equipped with at least one spiritual gift where they can invest their gift for the good of the church. No one's left behind when it comes to these gifts. No one is excluded, and all have an active role in participating in what God is doing. To each, Paul writes, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That brings us to our text, Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, is loosely divided into three basic sections. Verse 9, which encompasses the entire text, speaks of two important principles that govern the Christian life. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And if believers would only remember and adhere to these basic principles, they would do well. Verses 10 through 13 speaks to the attitude as well as the actions of believers toward other believers. This is where we're going to spend our time this morning. Their love and care for Christians in every circumstance. Verse 14 through 21 explains how believers should respond to unbelievers, those outside the church, enemies, and opponents of the gospel. And while verses 1 through 9 speak primarily to the body, the entire church, these 13 verses will speak uh, to the conduct of individual believers, which means This is very personal. This is where we examine ourselves to see exactly where we are in the faith. So Paul begins in chapter 9 in this section with this. Let love be genuine. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what's commonly known as the love chapter, Paul describes Biblical, God-like love. A love the world is incapable of understanding. Love is patient, he writes, and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. John writes, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And as he writes to the Romans here in chapter 12, Paul doesn't describe love like he did in 1 Corinthians, but rather he describes what love looks like when it's lived out by the believer. This is the practical application of the theology he's been teaching. How believers are to conduct themselves, how they're to live, how they're to live within the family of faith. Let love be genuine. Let it be real. Let it be sincere. Let it be authentic. Don't pretend to love one another. Don't fake it and don't be a phony. Rather, love one another with practical authenticity. 
Love because you mean it. Love because that's what we've been called to do. Peter writes, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. That means we work at it. We look for ways to invest in and love one another. We're not passive Christians. We are energetic. We are excited. We are thrilled with the opportunity of investing in one another's lives. To Timothy, Paul writes, the aim of our charge is love. Love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. There are no ulterior motives to this love. We love because God is love, because we have been loved, and we want to love in that way. Jesus said this to his followers, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, by this love, all people, the outside world included, will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the defining mark of a believer. It's love. Love for God, love for one another, and love for the world. And if for any reason this kind of love eludes us, if it seems unattainable and out of reach, if we've grown hard-hearted and bitter through whatever experiences we work through, we must go to God in prayer. Because the only one capable of remedying this situation, a hard-heartedness, a bitterness, is the Holy Spirit Himself who pours God's love into our heart and transforms us. The work of the Holy Spirit is amazing because He changes us where we start to think like God thinks. We start to love in a way that God loves. This is something the world has no concept of. To test Jesus, a, a lawyer approached him one day and asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said, You shall love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. So the guy said, well, I knew that one. Jesus says, wait a minute. I'm not done. The second is like it. What? There's more? The second is like it. You shall love the same word, your neighbor as yourself. The point Jesus makes is if someone claims to love God while at the same time, at the same time they hate their neighbor, their claim to a genuine relationship with God is inconsistent with his teachings and therefore they are not in the faith. This is really important. John writes, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. That's fairly straightforward. He's a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And since love for one another is the central demand of the gospel, the mark of a genuine believer is love. Love. And to refuse to love one another is to expose one's true allegiance. Paul writes this in chapter 3 of Romans, verse 8. Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in one word. This word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. We are to love with a genuine love which is given by God himself. The Holy Spirit pours God's love into our hearts. 
Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. To abhor what is evil is to hate exceedingly all that's opposed to God. It's to hate whatever God hates. Proverbs tells us some of what God hates. This is in Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. As Christians, what is blatantly wicked, blatantly evil, and blatantly godless should repulse, sicken, and disgust us. We're to abstain, Paul writes, from every form of of evil. We're to run from it, flee from it, detest it, and don't look back. Because of our love for Jesus, we who believe should never partake in anything that will hinder our relationship with Him. So that's a life of intentionality where we look at what we know to be wrong and we say, nope, not doing it. I will not insult my God by doing this, whatever this thing happens to be, if we know it to be wrong. The psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 101, verse 3, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. So he's making this decision. I will not do this. I will not look at what is not as profitable. I will not touch. I will not go. I will not do it. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. I will not partake. I will not look. I will not go. My feet will never head in that direction. I have made my choice. I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and these eyes will only look on that which is worthy. That love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. To hold fast to what is good is to cling to, it's to embrace and value that which is virtuous, noble, and worthy. This speaks of moral excellence. While writing to Timothy, Paul said, The godless of this world refuse to love what is good. They run to evil instead. Their actions are a result of their God-hating attitude. Do not participate. Do not go down that road. Paul advised the Thessalonian believers to test everything and hold fast or cling to that which is good. Notice the intentionality here. We just don't walk through life blindly. We make choices, and we've got to make good ones, ones that glorify God and help us grow in our faith. As believers, we're obligated by love to pursue what is good and reject what is evil. John writes in 3 John 11, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Again, intentionality. I'm making choices. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So Paul then moves into Verse 10, after giving these two principles that should govern our lives, and he says this, love one another with brotherly affection. Brotherly affection. Dealing with the attitudes of these Roman believers, Paul tells them this, 
to love one another with brotherly affection. And th what this suggests is genuine concern for one another. Genuine concern. And it implies more than just a handshake and a tip of the hat. More than just friendship. It implies family devotion. As members of one body in Christ, which we looked at last time, believers must never think of themselves more highly than they ought to think, but to think with sober judgment instead. In other words, they're not to be arrogant, they're not to be rude, they're not to be prideful, and they're not to look down their noses at others. But rather, as Jesus was concerned with your welfare and mine, so too are we to be concerned with one another's welfare. How are you doing with a genuineness? How are you doing? How's life? How can I help if you're suffering? We're to be concerned, especially here at home. He continues in the second part of verse 10, outdo one another in showing honor. To outdo one another in showing honor is to deliberately recognize others and praise their accomplishments. It's to cheer them on and take true pleasure in their advancement. Have you ever thought maybe perhaps at your job you were next in line to get an advancement and someone else gets what you think you should have got? How does that make us feel? It's like, oh, that's not fair. That was my place. That was my job. That was my honor. Paul says, I don't want any of that in the church. When one of us succeed, cheer each other on. Don't be envious and go, man, what makes you so special? Cheer one another on. Outdo one another in showing honor. What Paul's talking about here is the antithesis of envy. Envy, as you probably know, is an incredibly destructive force, an incredibly destructive thing, and Paul wants none of that in the church. Because of envy, Cain murdered his brother Abel. Because of envy, Jacob and Esau lived in a constant state of resentment. Both men wanted what the other had. And when Jacob stole his brother's blessing, a furious Esau, he made plans to murder his brother. Leah and Rachel envied each other as well. Leah was fertile and Rachel was barren. And while she could bear the children Rachel longed for, Leah longed for the love Rachel shared with Jacob. And both of these women grew to hate one another envy i want what you have i i i it just i belong it's mine why, why do you have what i don't have king david was envied or david excuse me was envied by king saul when the woman sang saul has killed his thousands and david his tens of thousands saul seethed with envy for this kid why are they singing your praises when they should be singing mine? Envy is extremely destructive. It does not belong in the church. One fellow puts it this way, and I, I like it, the way he puts it. It is possible for us to feel very self-righteous as we watch Saul pursuing his vengeful course. We, of course, would never go for that. Or would we? According to the Lord, the feeling that another person deserves the title of fool or moron is to commit the moral equivalent of murder, to have contempt for another's ability or person is to be as guilty as Saul in God's sight. Now, I didn't want to quote this because I'm guilty here. How many of us have called people names? driving down the road you moron my wife reminds me that 
probably I shouldn't be doing that. You fool, you moron. That can't happen in a church. Don't call each other names. Don't be boastful and prideful and rude and arrogant. Don't do that. It doesn't belong in the church. To the Philippians, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Look, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Verse 11, he continues and he says, listen, do not be slothful in zeal. What does that mean? To be slothful in zeal suggests laziness, dead formality, going through the motions. Sunday after Sunday, I go to church for an hour, and, and you just kind of get into this cycle of just monotonous, lifeless, loveless, and deedless faith. The temptation to lose steam in our lifelong responsibility to reverence God in every aspect of our lives, to become lazy, to become complacent in our pursuit of what's good, well-pleasing to the Lord, and perfect. Well, it's a natural one, says one commentator, but it must be strenuously resisted. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're to be especially cautious that we're not lulled into a state of spiritual lethargy, exhaustion, and sluggishness, where because of life's grind, we are reduced to simply going through the motions of our faith. This is a tough way to live. It really is. And again... I have experienced this. At times, I found myself in this monotonous rut. No fire, no energy, no passion. In 1994, a fellow I know by the name of Brian Dirksen wrote the song, Light the Fire Again, and it kind of speaks to this sort of rut that we at times get into. And we need to go to God and say, would you help me in this area? Would you light the fire in me again so that I can continue to do what I've been called to do? Don't let our love go cold, he writes. I'm calling out, light the fire again. Don't let our vision die. I'm calling out, light the fire again. You know my heart and my deeds Light the fire again. I need your discipline. I'm calling out, light the fire again. I am here to buy gold refined in the fire, naked and poor, wretched and blind. I come, clothe me in white so I won't be ashamed. Lord, would you light the fire again? Light the fire. And that brings us to his next point, Paul's point. Be fervent in spirit. Be fervent in spirit conveys the idea of being set on fire by God's spirit. It's to be excited about the gospel, to be excited about the church, and excited about the mission where love for one another is liberally bestowed with a sincere burning energy. Such love calls for our absolute best. Like Paul, we should most gladly be willing to be spent and to spend for the sake of others. Luther said he worked so hard that when he went to bed, he literally fell into bed. Ever been there? Moody's bedtime prayer on one occasion was, Lord, I'm tired. Amen. John Wesley rode 60 to 70 miles a day and on average preached three sermons a day. I can't wrap my head around that. 
I don't know about you, but it's far better to go to bed tired and exhausted rather than bored and disinterested. As Christ followers, we have been entrusted with the good news, the gospel. And for the sake of the gospel, our attitude toward one another should be one of genuine care and genuine concern. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. To serve the Lord is a tangible expression of love. It's practically doing the things that we're called to do. When Jesus washed his disciples' feet, they weren't sure how to take this. What are you doing? Peter's initial reaction to what Jesus was about to do was to refuse him from doing such a menial task. Jesus, like, you're not touching my feet. You'll never wash mine. As we know, the disciples' natural predisposition was to exalt themselves above one another and then fight over their supposed position in this new and glorious kingdom. I'm better than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm bigger than you. I'm brighter than you. Jesus said, listen, do you understand what I have done after washing their feet? He's trying to teach them something here. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet... You also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Don't think too much of yourselves. We're all in one family. We are all together. We all are God's children. The point Paul makes is everything we do, including how we treat, talk to, and act around one another is to be done in genuine love and humility, real care, real concern, and as a service to the Lord. The psalmist writes in Psalm 100, verse 1, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve, this is the same word, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and His faithfulness to all generations. Serve the Lord. Contribute to the needs of the saints, verse 13. This is yet another way believers are to help one another. Now here Paul's not urging believers to simply fellowship with one another, that is to uh, have a handshake or a cup of coffee. He's, he's asking them or commanding them to participate in the needs of the saints. So this is where we, we, we get practically involved in others' lives, especially when they need something. Specifically in the area of food, clothing, and shelter. Paul's talking about sharing what we have with those who are in need. When Paul took up a collection for the the poor believers in Jerusalem, the Macedonian Christians who were desperately poor themselves begged him for the favor of participating in this collection. Paul, please allow us to participate in it. He didn't even ask them. They just found out that he was taking up a collection. What about us? What about us? We too want to participate in helping the poor. Though they had little to offer um, for the benefit of others, they were willing to part with what little they had. To these believers, money was nothing more than a God-given blessing, and they used what money they had to help the church. So money didn't have a hold on these people. 
their resources were willingly shared with others in need. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve money and me. You cannot hold on to both at the same time. You will love one and hate the other. You will despise the one and love the other. No one can serve two masters. You will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, Jesus said. And when the church is living in genuine love, genuine concern for one another, the needs of its people are met through the sharing and caring of the church, of others, of one another. Contribute to the needs of the saints. The second part of that verse, seek to show hospitality, another directive, another command, another thing that we're to, to do. When it comes to showing hospitality, Believers are to pursue or chase hard after any opportunity to house or feed traveling Christians. Jesus said, whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's award. Reward, excuse me. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. In the New Testament, hospitality was of the utmost importance. Without it, the spread of the gospel during the days of the early church would have been greatly hindered. There wasn't hotels everywhere like there is today. In response to the Great Commission, people saddled up all their belongings and went on the road preaching and teaching the gospel. Apostles, preachers, and teachers traveled the four corners of the Roman Empire with the good news. And they needed a place to stay. They needed a place to eat. They needed the church to take care of them. Paul demands that the church step up, take responsibility for these folks, and take care of them. Because Believers were to offer hospitality. They were to go out of their way, look for opportunities to benefit them, to take care of them, to see that their needs were met. 3 John 5, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, these traveling preachers, strangers as they are who testify to your love before the church, you will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. You got food for your journey. You got new clothes. You got new sandals. How can we help you as you go to the next place to preach? For they have gone out for the sake of the name, the name of Jesus, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. This is the church's responsibility. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. By participating, we become participants in the spread of the gospel. The writer of Hebrews says this, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, Let brotherly love continue the same language. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unaware. A second, third century theologian puts it this way. How finely does he, Paul, sum up the generosity of the man who pursues hospitality in one word. For by saying that hospitality is to be pursued, he shows that we are not just to receive the stranger when he comes to us, but actually to inquire after and look carefully for strangers, to pursue them and search them out everywhere. Switching his focus 
from the believer's attitude of love in the church, Paul will turn to their attitude of love in the world, and we'll get to that next time. But in the meantime, think about a command of Jesus. Think about what Jesus says here, because it's actually quite stunning. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. And here Paul reminds believers of what's required of them. Instead of cursing their opponents, requesting God to bring disaster and ruin on them, they're to bless them instead. They're to call on God to bestow his favor on them. Now, I don't know about you, but that calls for a radical new way of thinking, a radical love, a God kind of love. And it also calls for astonishing humility. I mean, it's one thing to not curse your enemy, but to bless and pray for them. Well, that's a tall order, right? Especially if they're vigorously opposing us, if they're against us, and if they're against the church. Make no mistake, love for one's enemy does not come naturally. As far as the world is concerned, this makes zero sense. No sense whatsoever. Who loves their enemy? Who loves their enemy? Well, thankfully, God does. God does. Otherwise, none of us would be saved. The good news is this. Genuine love for our enemies, which we will look at next time, is possible as it comes through the power of the Holy Spirit who again pours God's love into our hearts. As ambassadors for Christ, we're to live differently than we once did and we're to excitedly extend the love that's been given to us to those lost in a sea of despair. On July 4th, 1854, Charlie Peace, a well-known criminal in London, was hung. The Anglican Church, which had a ceremony for everything, even had a ceremony for hanging people. So when Charlie Peace was marched to the gallows, a priest read these words from the prayer book. Those who die without Christ experience hell which is the pain of forever dying without the release which death itself can bring. When these chilling words were read, Charlie P. stopped in his tracks, turned to the priest and shouted in his face, Do you believe that? Do you believe that? The priest, taken aback by this verbal assault, stammered for a moment and said, Well, well I suppose that I do. Well, I don't, said Charlie, but if I did, I'd get down on my hands and knees and crawl all over Great Britain, even if it were paved with pieces of broken glass, if I could rescue one person from what you just told me. The hopeless in this world desperately need to hear the message of the gospel but it also needs, or they also need, to visibly see the love of God in the church among its members. Jesus said, by this love, all people, the world, will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. To the Thessalonians, Paul could have prayed, may the Lord make you increase and abound in strength since you are suffering. Or he could have said, may the Lord make you increase and abound in endurance since you are being afflicted. Or he could have said, may the Lord make you increase and abound in tolerance since they were being tested. But his earnest prayer was that they would increase and abound in love so that they would be effective. We'll close with 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 11. Now may the 
Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So let's pray. So Lord, as we study these words, I pray we would understand the significance of our calling that because of our salvation, your great mercy we're to love you, we're to love one another, and we are to love the lost as well. Help us develop in this area of love. Lord, that we would abhor what is evil, we would cling to what is good, we would live honorably before you so that our testimony might be credible in a world gone astray. So Lord, I thank you for each one that is here this morning and for those who are coming even now. And I pray that you would be with each one of us throughout this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.